just two points. Uh, last time, there was a typo. I fixed two typos. One was the question about the identity element, which obviously should give you the group element. I re-upload the slides when I fix the typos. So make sure you always get the latest version. You can see the date that I upload them. And in this example, I forgot to exclude the zero. Obviously, we can't divide by zero. We should exclude it so the group makes sense. With that, we're going to continue where we left last time, and that was on the topic of adjoint. I'm going to switch to writing, but adjoint came up when I asked the question that if I have the velocity in one frame, moving frame, then how can I have the velocity in the fixed frame? You know it already for maybe a vector. We can rotate it. That's not good enough. Because if you move and rotate at the same time, the rotation will generate linear velocity. We know that from physics, that if we rotate about a center of rotation, that angular motion for points that are farther from that center will generate greater linear velocity. So just Rotating or just translating is not the same as rotating and translating at the same time. That's a little more complicated. So we need a generalized framework to automate everything, and the adjoint will do it. We'll see. It. And the second part is this figure is really good, and it is the truth but it's also very demanding to understand because it's relying on differential geometric concepts. These are not topics that most people have background in in engineering, so it's a little difficult to imagine. Manipulating some algebraic terms and making sense of them might be easier. So I'm going to try to do it for SO3 to convince you that this is true. But then we also argue that it is general and true for any matrix Lie groups. Let's switch to handwriting. Oops. I'm going to start with the Lie algebra of SE3. What does it look like? We said that this is a group of all matrices these are let's say three by three matrices such that when you transpose a matrix, you get the negative of the same matrix. Now, the only matrices that can satisfy this property are skew-symmetric matrices. That's correct, it's O3, thank you. So you're learning, that's good. So it's O3, special orthogonal group. The skew symmetric matrix, I'm gonna use omega, this is a very convenient notation because we associate it with angular velocity from physics. So if I have a vector omega of angular velocity, I can write it as this vector as we are used to it. 
This is a three vector. You have three real numbers. It will give us a three vector. We associate this with a rate of the rate of rotation about axis one, axis two, axis three. Okay. And we can think about the three D space e one, e two, e three. And you might know from linear algebra, the reason I use one, two, three, because we don't have enough alphabets. If I go X, Y, Z, then I'm talking about SE3. We have to talk about three more dimensions. If I work with higher dimensional spaces that we don't do, then we, we're out of alphabets. So one, two, three, four, five, six is easier to work with. But these are the famili familiar X, Y, Z, okay? You could use X, Y, Z as well. Now, we introduce a new notation. Call it wedge. The wedge notation, it has a hat. Sometimes people put it in the middle. It doesn't matter. This notation, you can think about it as pointing up. It's an expansion. It turns this matri vector into a matrix, but not any matrix. It arranges omega 1, 2, 3 into a skew-symmetric matrix. So diagonal is 0. We have omega 3, negative of omega 2, negative of omega 3, 0, And zero. Okay. So in SO3, all the matrices, they look like this. Whatever you pick from that set, that it has this structure. But the number, the value of omega 1, 2, and 3 will be different. And that shows diff a different angular velocity. Now, this is very convenient to use because when we talk about matrices, we're going to call it as part of SO3. When it's a vector, it's just R3. You can obviously go back and forth without losing anything. It's just a matter of what you want to do. You want to work with vectors or matrices. As we will see, both are important, and we need both of them. Now, sometimes we might abuse the notation. If it's clear from the context, maybe the notation is dropped. I try not to do that because it will be confusing. But sometimes from the context, it's obvious that it must be a matrix. It cannot be a vector. So pay attention to that as well. But I try not to abuse the notation. You can define the opposite of this as well. It's called V, such that when you have omega hat, which is at this point, it's basically, it's a matrix. You can call it S. Now, what V notation does is that it moves it back to a vector. You might have a function. It takes the matrix. It reads element one, two, right? Two, three, and maybe three, one, and then put it in a vector for you and return it. So you don't lose anything. You can go back and forth. You'll see it in my code. You can call this uh, an isomorphism. That means there's a one-to-one -one mapping. You don't lose anything. It's just a matter of convenience. So V is the opposite of wedge. And they are quite a standard in robotics. All right, so we learned a new notation. I'm going to point out that I can decompose the skew-symmetric matrix into the sum of three independent 
matrices. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to define G1 to be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, negative 1. Now, this is equivalent of my standard basis in R3, which I would write 1, 0, 0. Why? We will see soon. If it's a matrix, we can have a vector. The basis should be a matrix as well. So that this G1 will play the same role for us. It's called usually a generator, or we can call it a Lie algebra basis. We can have G2 that you can guess. It will be 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So it's about the second one. And this is equivalent to the standard basis for the second axis. Now I'm going to define G3. It's easy to see that this omega that we have on top is a scalar omega 1 multiplied by g1 plus Scalar omega 2 multiplied by G2 plus omega 3 multiplied by G3. This is equivalent of working in R3 and writing omega as a vector is omega 1 E1 plus omega 2 E2 plus omega 3 E3. Okay? So we're going to make ourselves comfortable with this. Sometimes we want to work with matrices, sometimes with vectors. For SE3, we will have six of them. G1, G2, G3, G4, G5, G6, because three degrees of freedom for the rotation, and then we will have three degrees of freedom for the translation. The SE3 is a six-dimensional uh, space. The rigid body has six degrees of freedom. We understand that in 3D space, so we need six independent direction in the space. These directions in the matrix spaces will be modeled using these generators. I'm going to give you a surprising observation, and then we will talk about how to drive it. When we talk about the adjoint, we'll show where it comes from. I will define, first of all, you know that we can multiply E1 by E2 using the cross product. So the topic is maybe I should use a new page. So you know cross product but you probably don't know Lie bracket. E1 cross E2, what do we get? E3. 
So the cross product will give a new vector that is orthogonal to the other two vectors. And these are unit vectors, so we will just really change in direction. Also, if we change the order of the cross product, we will negate the sign, the direction. It doesn't change the magnitude, but it, will, it does change the direction. So we can have E1 cross, I'll just use this one example. Now, I'm going to define this notation See, we can start from defining something and show that it makes sense. A lot of time textbooks do that as well because it's just convenient, but it leaves you with a question of where it comes from. So it's nice to know where it comes from. I'm gonna define it here, hopefully in this lecture, when we talk about the adjoint, then we show where it comes from. This will be G1 times G2 minus G2 times G1. This will give you G3. This is just a simple matrix multiplication. G1 is a matrix, G2 is a matrix. Multiply them, subtract the opposite multiplication, G2 minus G1, see what you get. You will get G3. So that's the equivalent, uh, this is equivalent to cross product using these matrix spaces. I wanted you to be more surprised, but that's okay. <laughs> Isn't it cool? You can define a new way of doing cross product using matrix multiplication. That's a great question. If this is the same as the cross product, does it follow the same rule of, it's called anti-commutativity, meaning if we change the order, do we get the negative sign? Yes, we do. If you do G2 and G1, then we will get negative of G3. So remembering the cross product formula is very painful, but this matrix multiplication to me is easier. We're not replacing anything, but this is, if we're working with uh, matrix spaces, we don't need to go to that vector version to do a cross product. We, we are doing, we can do it in the matrix form. This is called Lie bracket. Now this is more general because the cross product is for 3D. We don't have cross product for four dimensional in the sense that we know and we work with it. There is a generalization of that using exterior algebra, but that's not what we typically work with. The Lie bracket, however, is true for any dimension. You can work in any dimension of the Lie group and you still have the Lie bracket, which is performing that operation for you. That means it takes two direction in the space and it gives you a direction that is orthogonal to the other two. Okay, this is very interesting because you can get a four dimensional space, grab two of the bases, and then you get a direction that is independent of the other two. In higher dimensional spaces, do you have to multiply more than two matrices together? No, your matrices just are just bigger. Your G matrices are different because it's not just three by three. If it's n, it will be n by n. So this is called Lie bracket. Now we're not, this is not a control course, but Lie bracket is the equivalent of Lie derivative in control for Lie groups. You can do a lot of things with it. 
It's a, it's a form of taking actually a derivative. So if, um, if we're dealing in four dimensional space instead of three dimensional space, so you would do G1 comma G2 to get G3, and then would you simply do G3 or G2, or sorry, G1 comma G2 to get G3, and then would you simply do, do G2 comma G3 to get G4? Well, the question is, if it's four-dimensional, what would we get? My answer would be write down, see what you get. You have four standard bases, form the generators. You will need a four by four schizometric matrix. See what that looks like. Decompose it into four independent matrices that you can sum them up and get the same vector. Then use the Lie, then pick two bases, then use Lie bracket to generate the other ones. So these bases are not unique in the sense that you, we could work with other bases in 3D instead of the standard bases. These are not unique. You can generate, you can use other types of bases. You can work with the negative of them, right? That's not a problem. In physics, in fact, they complexify them. They make these bases to have complex number, but we don't, we don't do that. So anyway, this is the equivalent of, uh, to the cross product. We'll see later why. And it's called the Lie bracket. And notice that the result is always in the Lie algebra. You pick two elements of the Lie algebra, you calculate the Lie bracket, the outcome is always part of the Lie algebra again. Is this closed? So your question is, if we work with more than three dimensions, how, would you know, how do we know how many we need? How many bases we need? Well, we have to write it down and then see what we get. There's no point of guessing. Yes, maybe we define one and two and get another one and you call it third. Maybe you get another one, call it fourth. I could call the first one here third. It doesn't make any difference. It's just the naming convention, right? But we, we are focused on 3D, so don't worry about it. Just know that this is a very general framework. It will work with higher dimensions as well. So maybe not physically, but if you're working with some sort of data that might be in high dimensional, you can actually rotate it. So it might come up in data science and machine learning, possibly. All right, so now we're going back to the constraint we have for the rotation matrices. I want to talk about the differential equation that is intrinsic to each Lie group. And that means talking about R dot R transpose equals some omega skew, right? But also R transpose R dot equals sum omega skew. I'm gonna call this S, and we're gonna call this one B for the reason we will discover. We want to understand this, why it's like this. So we're going to start with the constraint that we have. We know that for SO3, for any rotation matrix in SO3, we have 
R transpose times R equals the identity. We also have R times R transpose equals the identity matrix. So the rotation matrix is an orthogonal matrix. Because it's the direct cosine of three perpendicular axes. When we move the axis, that's from the rigid body lecture, and we project them again to the original axis, we do not change the right angle between our axes. So any two dot product should be one if it's the same vector, when we have our, our transpose, and any dot product for two vectors that are orthogonal will be zero. That's where we get this constraint. So what we do, we will differentiate this property. So if we differentiate this property with respect to time, we get R transpose, R dot transpose, R plus R transpose, R dot. And the right-hand side is zero. R dot is the time derivative of the rotation matrix. Whatever it is, we don't know. But we know that we can have a rate of rotation if the rotation is time variant. That means if rotation has nine elements, a three by three matrix, R dot is a matrix that it has nine time derivative version of that. So it has nine elements. It's not necessarily a schizometric because you have to take time derivative of each term. Whatever it is, we don't know. But it's the rate of change of that rotation matrix. So from this constraint, we can conclude that So we can conclude that if you get a rotation matrix and, it, and you take its time derivative and multiply it by left from R transpose, the same rotation matrix, it will give you a matrix such that when you transpose it, you get a negative matrix. We know that this, will, this must be a skew-symmetric matrix. So we know that R transpose times R dot is a skew-symmetric matrix, although R dot is not. Together they are. Now, if it's a skew-symmetric matrix, then, of course, it belongs to one of, it, it will be one of the elements of the Lie algebra, SO3. So that tells us that the result will be in the Lie algebra. If we do the other way for R, R transpose, we can carry out the similar calculation. We get R dot R transpose plus R, R dot transpose. Again, we get a property that if you multiply the same R dot from the right side this time by R transpose, again, it's a skew symmetric matrix. So no matter from what side we multiply it by the transpose of the rotation, we get a skew symmetric matrix. So algebraically, this follows from um, the constraint of the orthogonal group. Geometrically, it has that complicated reason that which 
we're mapping, translating terms on the tangent space where we are to the identity. And the Lie algebra is a place where we get skew-symmetric matrices. So without just using algebra, we know that the result will be skew-symmetric matrix. Now, what we want to do, we want to make sense of this. Which one is which, in the sense that I have two options. I need to pick one to work with. And under what condition I should choose which one. Once we know that, then everything will be clear. So the first one that I'm going to write is R transpose R dot equals omega is Q. Now we know that if we have a frame of reference A, and I have another frame of reference B, The rotation that describes the orientation of frame B with respect to frame A that we saw in the rigid body transformation, it can transform coordinates of a point in frame B to be in frame A. In fact, that's how we derive the rotation matrix. That was the derivation that we followed to say this property is true and the matrix we get for a change of coordinates will transform a point from a moving frame, let's say, to the second frame, to the base frame or fixed frame, or from body frame B to a fixed frame. What if I have a vector B, and that's the difference between two points in frame B. I call it P and Q, and I have a vector V. It's a delta between two points, okay? So you can have two points, and then you get a delta, you get a vector. What about vectors? Can I also rotate vectors so that, let's say, my velocity vectors in frame B to be described in frame A. We can show that this is possible, because if we multiply both sides by rotation, So R times P in frame B will give me a point in frame A. The second one will give me a point also in frame A. This is just the equivalent of that delta. Whatever it is, it's the same thing as multiplying rotation directly to that delta because this is a linear map. Obviously, it will work, right? It's a property of a linear map when you apply it to individual terms. If you add them up, you can directly apply the rotation to the output. So what we learn is that a V a vector in frame A is a rotated version of a vector in frame B. So we just verify that this is true. So we know that if we have a vector and we rotate it, it will change the frame of reference.
There's a question on Lee, Lee Brackett. I'll get back to that when we talk about it again. All right, so let's make sense of what we have here. I'm going to write this as multiply both sides by rotation. We get r dot equals r omega. Now this, of course, is the same thing as we have in the first line. This follows from the constraint. However, if I had to think in the, in the mindset of frames, if omega is in the body frame, and if I multiply this by a rotation that describes the relationship, the orientation of frame B in terms of frame A, the results should be another vector that is in frame A. So I know physically on the right hand side, I am just transforming the angle of velocity with respect to my fixed, to be in the fixed frame, right? So that means that I measure the rate of rotation in the body frame, which is what we physically are capable of doing it because the velocity in the body frame is independent of your inertial frame. You can pick a coordinate here or the other side of the room, your accelerometer or angular gyroscope on the phone will read the same quantity. Physically, of course, the gyroscope doesn't give a damn that where is your coordinate, right? That's just not re relevant to the sensor. So we can read it in the body frame, it's independent of inertial frame, we can rotate it to be in the fixed frame, which I should use S from now on because that's called a spatial frame, which is a fixed frame. It's the same thing as inertial frame. Inertial frames don't accelerate. If frames relative to each other accelerate, we're in trouble. And it's a very common assumption in physics. But for us, this is a fixed frame. B is attached to the robot and is moving. This is body frame, your robot or sensor. So because of that, I may use S here. So we learned that the rate of rotation, the rate of rotation matrix is described by the rotation matrix times the angular velocity. Now we need to work with the matrix because the left hand side is a three by three matrix, the right hand side must be a matrix as well. This looks a little misleading because once you have translation, it won't be just rotation. But for rotation groups, this works. Could you explain again what it means to take that derivative of r with respect to time? So what does it mean, the question is, what does it mean to take the derivative of the rotation matrix, matrix with respect to time? Imagine you have So we just showed that that property holds, and that describes the rate of rotation matrix. I'm not going, going back to it. So your rotation matrix maybe is 2D. And maybe your angle is changing with time. So we know that time derivative of this angle respect to time is something like theta dot. What is the derivative of a matrix? You 
it is easier than what you imagine. So we just need to take the derivative element-wise. You could flatten your matrix and treat it as a vector and then do it element-wise as well. Now, when you differentiate cosine, for, for example, you get theta dot times sine of theta or negative, whatever it is, right? We don't want to look into it. It's too scary. So um, we just leave it at that, right? So whatever it is, we can take the derivative. It is some messy matrix of time derivatives of angles, and sometimes if you wish to look at it in some coordinates maybe Euler angles or something similar to that. But it's a three by three matrix of time derivatives of these individual rotation terms, okay? Because each column will describe the rate of rot rotation of the, let's say, first axis with respect to the first axis, second axis, and the third axis. The second column will describe the rate of rotation of the second axis with respect to first, second, and third, and so on. So we know that the, if we measure the velocity, angular velocity in the body frame, we, uh, we can make sense of this um, property here that we derived, and it is the differential equation of the Lie group. And in fact, we can solve it. Given an, given an initial condition, we can solve this assuming, let's say, a delta t time and this velocity is constant. We can integrate it. It will end up being a matrix exponential. This follows from homogeneous linear differential equations that are separable. Just a hint that you will write like this. Now you integrate from both sides. Derivative divided by the variable itself, right? It's, when you, it's a derivative of the logarithm. You can integrate both sides. Then take the exponential of both, both sides. The exponential will pop out. That's why we see it. You plug in the initial value. Then you figure out the constant. Then for a delta t time, what you get is that between time and step, let's say k and k plus 1, we get k plus 1. R k plus 1 is R k times matrix exponential of omega delta t. This is the correct rule of integration for this matrix group, not adding two matrices, because the exponential of omega delta t will be ultimately a delta rotation matrix. I'm going to delete this important remark here. Now, if you don't remember these ODEs, that's okay. I can share references with you. But that's a very elementary type of differential equation, and we can solve it. All right, so that's an integration rule, which is basically the rotation at the next time step, if we discretize it using a delta t time, and assuming zero order hold, that means the input, the velocity, during that delta t is constant, is not changing. Otherwise, you have to integrate based on whatever rule it's, it's following that we don't know. So in practice, it's very common to assume zero order hold. That means your signal is like this. For each delta t, it's constant. First order hold means it's linearly increasing. 
You can do that too, but it will be somewhat unnecessarily complicated because something like a gyroscope works, operates at a very high frequency. This delta T will be very small, like 500 hertz. 100 hertz at, at the minimum, but can be 1,000 hertz. So delta T will be one millisecond, for example. Mm -hmm. Is it because of the, um, the first half of this zero is so then it would be changes? No, this is this follows from linear differential equation topic. So you have x dot equals x, let's say a times x. We can separate this by writing x dot over x equals a. Now we can integrate both sides with respect to time because this differential equation is separable. We can separate all the x variables, one side, all the other terms to the other side. What is the derivative of, what is the function that is derivative is x dot over x? Log. So that will give us log of absolute value of x because the domain must be positive. This will give you, now if you don't assume it's constant, you have to leave it at that, right? If you don't assume a is constant or whatever it is, maybe it's a function of time. You just have to leave it to be like that. Maybe it has a function, you integrate, you get a constant. But anyway, you can relax the log. By taking the exponent, you take the exponential from both sides and get rid of the absolute value to contain all solutions and you can get x equals exponential of Now, there will be a constant here as well, because when you integrate, there will be a constant, right? This constant comes from initial value. That we might start from an initial rotation, maybe it's identity, right? We start, for example, from the identity, that's where we start the localization, maybe, and then we want to track. So that's how we can integrate rotation as we read gyroscope data. Okay, so we are relying on the math here that we can solve this. How do we derive the numerical equation? Because the integration is okay. How do we get the numerical results? The integral of a or a dt from zero to delta t, if a is constant, it will be a times t from zero to delta t is a delta t. Yeah. Okay? That's, that's exactly what I did here. So assuming constant velocity that we will assume a lot in future lectures, you will see this input times delta t. So we get rotation at time k plus one equals rotation at times k times some delta rotation. This exponential has a closed form formula for this group. We don't have to talk about it, but it's a formula that you can use it. It's a good topic for Piazza. So like, what do you mean locally constant? So like when you were explaining, I think the zero order, zero order hole, like the delta t is much smaller than the essentially the frequency. So that's like for each time step, the velocity is locally constant. 
Right, I, I mean in the body frame is constant because if you drive a term in general with respect to another frame, maybe some other interactions are going on, right? So the velocity in the body frame, we assume is fixed. It's an assumption that within a very tiny fraction of time, my sensor readings are constant because the sensor is digital anyway. We have a fixed frequency and then we get omega at time t1 and then we get omega at time t2 and then the, dif the difference is one millisecond maybe or 10 milliseconds. What's happening in between? Well, the obvious way is that let's say it's the same thing. Somebody else say let's increase it linearly somehow. Maybe you propose to take the square root of that. You can do that. Probably nobody will listen to you, but that's an idea. Yeah? So zero const uh, constant velocity is, is the standard assumption. Oh, excuse me. So omega t hat is uh, directly from? Sensor. Yeah. We read it directly from the sensor. R transpose uh, multiplied by R dot. So it's, we get it from the equation. Uh, yeah. So omega p hat is a function of uh, the rotation matrix, right? I would say so. So uh, omega p hat should not be some random, random angular velocity. It is coupling with on. The question is rotation and angular velocity are coupled because we have an equation that it's relating these two. Okay. Meaning the angular velocity cannot be anything if I know the rotation, right? Yeah. And rotation cannot be anything if I know the angular velocity. That's true. However, this is a very nice differential equation. I can separate the variables from uh, to two sides of the equation and directly integrate. We cannot, in general, integrate differential equations because it might be nonlinear or not separable. In this case, we can, and we can integrate to know that relationship in terms of a time difference equation instead of differential equation because for digital systems, we don't want to work with this. We want to work with the time difference equation. That's how you will code. You don't code R dot. You code RK plus one equals RK times some matrix. So the coupling is true, but because we can separate them, we can solve, solve it and get the time difference equation, which is desirable for digital systems, okay? So this is the correct way to discretize matrix groups, you will get an exponential. Now we need to make sense of it the, the other relationship, right? So we covered one side, so now we know what it means to have R transpose times R dot equals omega. Algebraically now we can make sense of it and physically we know what it means. However, we have By the way, I don't, I don't want you to, you know, you don't have to go read the whole differential equation book just because you don't remember that. We're taking it for granted. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. You can refresh it if you want to. But there are some limited results that we, we need to use, okay? So don't be hard on yourself if you didn't take your differential equation course seriously in undergrad. It's okay, we, we use just some results. So what about the other one? This looks a little um, different because now we have R dot, R transpose equals omega question mark hat. What frame of reference we should talk about here. I mean, it cannot be the same thing, right? Because 
you multiply a matrix from left and right, in general, you don't get the same answer. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. And the rotation in 3D, it is not commutative, unlike rotation in the plane in 2D. In 2D, if you just rotate about one axis, it makes sense. It's there the same. But about three axes, it's a whole different story. It becomes non-commutative. So we know that algebraically, this cannot be the same angular velocity. It doesn't make sense because the order is changed. And when we write r dot equals this omega question mark times r, I am going to use a magic formula here that we will prove shortly, and that is this property. Now I'm going to go back here and write r dot equals r omega hat r, which will give me, what do I get? So what do I need? I need R R transpose here. So R R transpose is the identity. I'm going to just add and subtract, which is multiplying by the inverse. So I get R, and of course we can change R to R transpose. We will get R transpose omega uh, skew, R trans, just R, and we get R transpose omega, this whole matrix will be skew, right? R transpose or inverse is just another matrix. We can always substitute it to get uh, this relationship. So what I will get is R transpose sum omega as a vector. By the way, this is a matrix. This is a vector. Now you know, right? That's why it's a vector. You multiply it by the rotation from left, and then you make it a skew matrix in that relationship. OK, so what uh, we can say about this one. So we have compared this to the previous equation where we had r dot equals r omega in the body frame, right? So together, we can say that r transpose this omega should be omega in the body frame, right? And therefore, we learned that this is, in fact, omega in the spatial frame. Because I am rotating my vector in the body frame using a rotation that is describing the orientation of the moving frame, the body frame, with respect to some other frame. We, we get to choose, but let's say it's a spatial frame. So if this is the rotation about body frame to the spatial frame, then we learn that one side is the velocity in the body frame. The other side of the differential equation that also comes with the matrix group describes the velocity in the spatial frame. So depending on what, which one you want to work with, 
you can choose your equation. Do you have a question? Makes a mix of vector bar transpose omega into a scoop matrix. From here, I'm using this relationship that we will prove shortly. Okay. Now, given that relationship, you follow what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, so we have to prove that. If that's true, this conclusion is true, right? How do we prove that omega is the actual angular velocity? What is an actual angular velocity? Because it is defined as uh, omega b, omega b hat. I mean, the omega b, the uh, b algebra, sorry. So uh, omega b is defined as. Oh, so you mean what makes us think that SO3, the Lie algebra, corresponds physically to the angular velocity? Yeah. Well, we have verified this, first of all, experimentally, right? It works in practice, but also it is a model that describes orientation. It is the time derivative of rotation. So what, uh, what justifies using a rotation matrix or Euler angles? It's just the fact that it describes the rotation between frames and we can derive it. Now, rate of change of that is the angular velocity because the integration of that is the rotation. So the angular velocity is just the velocity for rotational movement, right? It follows from that. So it's from experiments. Both experiments and theory, because we're talking about the rotation of a frame, right? Yep. What do you call the rate of that rotation? Rate of that rotation is a matrix, and it belongs to a matrix group, and it is also, yeah, it is, we can only say that it is belongs to SO3. So I'm going to make it simpler. Let's say I have, I have a circle here, then you have a car, and I'm not very good at drawing. <laughs> You are going around this circle, and it has an angle of theta at any time with respect to your horizontal axis. What do you call the rate of change of this angle? We could call it angular velocity. I mean, we're not in love with names, but... That's what people call it. So angle, angular velocity. Position, linear velocity or velocity. I mean, digging deeper than that is, is too philosophical. But <laughs> this is from, um, in physics, I, at least this much we understand, right? Absolutely. So we want to summarize what we did. You got, did you get your answer? Think about it and then pose a question on Piazza maybe. But this, this is what we're doing exactly. Okay. All right. So what did we do? We We said that we have a constraint in the orthogonal group. If we differentiate it, we get two relationships. Relationship one is telling us that r dot r transpose equals <clears throat> some 
angular velocity matrix, squissymetric matrix. If we calculate R transpose R, we get another angular velocity matrix. We wanted to make a physical sense of them so we don't make mistakes when we implement these equations for calculations. So we started with one of them. And before that, we showed that R transpose R dot or R dot R transpose is a skew-symmetric matrix, right? We first showed that in this page. Then we started from the first one and showed that because we get R dot equals R omega in this case, and if omega is in the body frame, the rotated version of that must be the angular velocity in the spatial frame, in the fixed frame. This is as simple as rotating your vector from frame B to frame A, okay? And I'm sure you've done it many times to be here. You took exams, right? <laughs> Should have solved some physics problem. So that's, that's basically as simple as that. Now, if that's the case, then it makes sense because at the rate which we integrate the rotation is the rate we read the angular velocity in the body frame and accumulate it by adding it to the previous rotation, which we could solve it to get this time difference equation, right? This integration rule, which is a discrete time equivalent of that differential equation. So R times omega makes sense. However, when we looked at the, the, look at the second equation, we have no idea what is omega skew times R. What does it mean to multiply the rotation from the right side? That's a little strange to us. To make sense of that, we use this property that we're going, I'm going to prove now, once we're done with this part. And that will give us, so we start from here, we go down. We have to use the property here. So what we learn is that we can form this equation to be in this shape, that r dot equals r times some skew symmetric matrix, but it's the r transpose times omega in some frame version of the angular velocity, right? Now, com compare this with the previous equation that we had r dot equals r omega. They must agree, otherwise something is wrong, right? You cannot have a two differential equations that look exactly the same, and then they give you two different answers. Conceptually, that's wrong. Mathematically, that's also not correct, because um, there's a theorem that the solution to the differential equation is unique, at least locally, it's always unique. That's a fundamental result in ODE. So then the term here inside this must be equal to the previous case that we had, okay? When we set them equal, uh, to be equal, and then we multiply both from left side by R transpose, we arrive at a relation between omega at the body frame omega that we measure in the body frame with respect to the same angular velocity in another frame, which is our fixed frame. And that is just described by rotation between the two frames. So then we learned that if you basically
integrate this equation now that r dot equals r right it will be like this if we integrate this using the same logic zero order hold constant velocity delta t time we get rk plus 1 equals now the exponential is on the left side now you read in literature that we choose this integration or retraction rule from left or right, right? Both are correct, but they have different meaning. When, it's, when the exponential is on the left, it means the argument, the velocity that you have there is in the spatial frame. Now, if you're doing an optimization, you might not care, because who cares? It's doing something inside, and then ultimately will give you a solution. But when we're doing uh, filtering and directly dealing with these terms for maybe uncertainty propagation, then we need to be aware of which bond we're choosing. And which, whatever you choose, you just need to stick to it. You cannot just change them arbitrarily. So that basically concludes this part that I'm gonna prove the property that we used, which you will be pleased that, you will be pleased to learn that that's just the adjoint property. For SO3, it ends up being like that. But when people don't want to talk Lie group, of course that's, then we talk about cross product and other things. So we want to, Prove that R omega is Q R transpose equals omega times R times omega is Q. And then as a reminder, this is in SO3. And omega as a vector is a three vector. So to prove this, we start from, first imagine, let's say A is any vector in R3, some, some vector. Did I tell you that for A and B in R3, A cross B is the same thing as you make a skew symmetric matrix and multiply that matrix by B. You, I'm guessing you've seen it maybe in the past. But a cross product can be done using matrix multiplication We can prove it if we will have if we have time we can get back to it but the proof is just using direct calculation get a and b two vectors get the cross product see what you get put it in a symmetric matrix multiplied by b if you get the same answer that's the proof if not we will give your money back <laughs> This is true, I guarantee <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so the proof is direct calculation. There's no trick, I leave it for you. I can post it on Piazza too, I think. I should have it from last year's Piazza. Okay, so our so now if that's the case, I can turn R omega is skewed to just the vector cross A, okay? 
then I'm going to do R omega cross R R transpose A because R R transpose is the identity. Then we say R times we factor R. So we just proved that from first side and the second side, and A was any vector, so this is true for all vectors, then the two sides must be true in general. So we get this property. That holds for rotation matrices and skew symmetric matrices. So that's a, this supports our previous derivations. Now what if we have <laughs> rotation and translation? Your question is for this part? Yeah. Oh, this part is, this follows directly from here. Multiply both sides by R from the right side, then R dot is omega in the spatial frame times R. You have a very good memory. <laughs> you were holding that for all the time I was talking about this proof. <laughs> you deserve a plus, but we don't give pluses here. So, okay. What can we say when we have translation? You can guess that it will get really nasty. And I hate these equations when you have something plus something cross. I always hated that, even when I didn't know Lie groups. We want something that is clean. You just multiply a matrix by a matrix or a vector. Don't ask me what does it mean. We learned one time what it means, but later we don't want to think about it. That's my philosophy. That will make it automated. We understand what it's doing but we don't want to be involved in the level of mechanics of it. What is getting, I don't know, multiplied by something. But when we look at the matrices, we know this is what we want to do on the higher level. So that, this is what we are after. about rotation and translation. So maybe you can imagine that at this time I have angular velocity and maybe also linear velocity. And there's nothing wrong with stacking them into a vector that is six-dimensional. 
This is just bookkeeping. Uh, we can stack it in six vector. We're not changing them. So what is the equivalent of that relationship we had with rotation matrices that when we multiply rotation by omega, we get something, another omega. In particular, body frame and a spatial frame. So what is the matrix here? That when I multiply it by this six vector, it will give me Something like that. If this is the velocity in the body frame, it will give me the twist. This is called twist. And we usually show it with Kisi, the Greek letter. But you can choose any other letter too. So what is the matrix that when we multiply it by the twist, it will map it from the body velocity, from the body frame to the inertial frame. Now you might th think that that's just the rotation, but that's not correct because it is only true if you're only moving using a linear velocity, then that's the rotation. Maybe there is a fixed rotation between your frames, right? And then that's basically mapping a vector from body frame to the inertial frame. However, if you're also rotating, and there's a rate of change for the rotation, so the matrix that describes the rotation between two frames is evolving over time. And that will result in some change in your linear velocity. Maybe I can convince you like this that, again, this is from freshman physics, physics mechanics, that you have I have two points you remember we arrived at this relation I chose a different Let's see. The velocity of point P in frame A I'm giving you the final results because I think it's better to spend time for other topics than driving this. If you have two frames, A and B, the linear velocity of a point in frame A, if you write it according to the point, the point in frame B, is that the same linear velocity of point in frame B plus the rotational velocity of, this is, this is basically VA equals VB plus omega cross R. Right? Oh, that's right. Thank you. So you know it from this form, that omega cross r. So if you rotate and move, the rotational movement will contribute to your linear velocity. That's just a fact. 
from physical observations and derivations of the linear velocity between two frames. So it is not that simple. This matrix will not be just a block diagonal of two rotations. There is a term, cross, cross term, off diagonal term, that takes the angular velocity and include its contribution to the linear velocity when it exists. Okay, so we, we have an intuition about this, but again, we're after a general way of deriving this. We're not interested in this way of manipulating terms. So that's uh, the topic of conjugation and matrix similarity. So what is a matrix similarity? Suppose I have two frames, E1, E2, and a point here, and I have another frame, E1 prime and E2 prime. And I know a transformation in E1 and E2 to be A, that's some matrix, whatever it is. It takes the point X in that coordinate frame, gives me Y. Maybe rotates it, maybe scale it, whatever it is. And I know a transformation that is doing the same operation, but it is in the other frame. How can I find the relationship between these two matrices? Meaning, if I know the transformation that takes me from one frame to the other frame, can I map A to T and vice versa? This leads to matrix similarity. Now suppose we have Y equals P inverse Y prime, meaning P or P inverse is a relationship between, is a transformation between the two frames. Similarly, I can map X prime. So we have Y equals AX, so therefore we have P inverse Y prime equals AP inverse X, and then y primes equal, y prime equals p a p inverse x, x prime. But y prime also equals t times x prime. Therefore, we learn that t equals p a p inverse. This is the formula for change of basis in linear algebra. You have a transformation, linear transformation in one coordinate frame. You change your coordinate. You want to know what's that matrix. You need the relative transformation between the two frames to do change of basis. Okay? Maybe you know the calibration of your LiDAR with respect to IMU, and then we want to know the same calibration transformation in the camera frame. Well, you need to know these relationships to do similarity transformation it comes up in sensor calibration extensively. A is rotation matrix? Could be. Any linear transformation, any matrix. And Y and X uh, belongs to R to the power of N. Y and X. Excuse me? I couldn't understand. Y and X are two X is a point in this frame E1 and E2. X is, maybe you can think about it, X1, X2. Y is Y1, Y2. So obviously A will be two by two, but this can be any dimension, any vector space, as long as A is a linear transformation, is a matrix. Oh, so P is, P is rotation. 
P is the transformation that describes this difference. In other words, E equals P inverse E prime. And E is E1 and E2. Or E prime equals P times E. It is, of course, an invertible transformation. You can think about rotation matrices, if that helps. Uh, it should be, because E and G prime are two unit vectors. So it's... Well, you can have translation, too. It doesn't have to be rotation. OK, you mean it can be the You can think about the rigid body, right? That's Special Euclidean. That's probably uh, the transformation you will come across, a rigid body. Rotation and translation. So this is called a matrix similarity, but this map is also called conjugation in math. Can you label X and Y in Question is, can we label X and Y in this drawing? Yeah, why not? We can have X, we can have Y. And no, no, right, no, no, X, Y, they're not the coordinates of one point. So A times X will give us Y, right? There are only so many letters. I have to choose something. Okay, so now we know what is a matrix similarity. So when we see it, we will recognize it. So I'm going to continue from All right, so all these stories, now when I show you this slide, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you need to know all of that, then I'm gonna throw at you a conjugation map. <laughs> and then I drop a line, a remark that notice similarity transformation, okay? All right. So a map that here is a group element G is a group element, rigid body transformation. A is another rigid body transformation. Calculate G times A times inverse. This is called a conjugation map. Take the derivative of conjugation map with respect to the middle part by assuming this rigid body transformation or rotation B goes through the identity. That means if we parameterize it with some T, At this point, you know that we can have B of T to be exponential of T times B. We just showed that this is true. When you have a velocity in the Lie algebra, this exponentiation shows up naturally and is the result of integrating velocity into the transformation. So if B is a path like this, it goes through the identity, meaning at zero, we will get exponential of zero, which is the identity matrix. When you differentiate it, you get B times exponential of TB, which is the same thing as exponential of TB times B, because the exponential of a matrix commutes with the matrix. Evaluate B prime at zero, what do you get? B. So take the derivative of the conjugation map at the identity when t is 0 with respect to the middle part, you get this property, G, real rigid body transformation, times B times G inverse. B is in the Lie algebra, G is in the group. Does this make sense? Can we multiply a rigid 
a rotation by angular velocity or a rigid body transformation by its equivalent of velocity that we didn't talk about it? Yes, every Lie group acts, acts on itself. Just like you can multiply rotation by a vector, you can always multiply the transformation of the Lie group by its own Lie algebra. You, at the very least, you have that. You can always do that. So this always true makes sense. You can do the multiplication. This is called the adjoint map. However, this is not giving us the matrix. This is a group version of that. We want to find the matrix. My slides are not moving. <laughs> Too stressed. <laughs> so what we're going to do, first, how do we find a matrix version of this? By just directly expanding this multiplication and see what we get. Rearranging it into a matrix. That's what we do. And I have the derivations for 2D and 3D to write it, but if there is no time to share it with you, but it is a direct calculation of some matrices. You just need to read it and see that it's true. We take one more derivative with respect to A to G. Well, something interesting. Uh, we will see something interesting. That's my desktop. Okay. All right. Take the derivative of G or A, whatever you want to call it. If you have A, B, A inverse, right? Now, first time, we took the derivative, derivative with respect to B, but you can also, once we have A, B, A inverse, we can talk about a path for A exactly in the same way. Initial velocity A, exponential, parameterized by T. That T is a scalar time. That's why it's called one parameter group. Although it's not a group, that's just a name for it. They call it one parameter group, that exponential of T A. Because using a scalar t, we can generate the geodesic, the path that lives on the group. So when you take the derivative of the adjoint with respect to a, you get the Lie bracket. So the Lie bracket is coming from differentiating the conjugation twice. The proof is your exercise, it's not very difficult. You need to find out what's the derivative of, of, of a matrix inverse. So there's a formula for it. If you use that, you can get this result. If you ask it on Piazza, I will help you to drive it. But if you don't, I won't give it to you. So the Lie bracket is what we defined previously it is related to the adjoint and conjugation. Mathematically, conjugation is the failure of the group to commute. Because if the group is commutative, this will be simply B. You can just shift terms. But for matrices, you cannot shift terms. The adjoint is the failure of the group to commute along a particular direction, B, a vector in the Lie algebra. Because if it's commutative, then the adjoint is identity. That's why for Euclidean spaces, you don't see adjoint, because it's the identity. 
It is there, but you just don't see it because the space is flat, it's commutative, it's always the identity. Again, mathematically, the Lie group is the failure of the group to commute in direction of A as you start moving in the other direction, B, right? You're moving along a direction, you want to move, you want to change direction. How non-commutative is your group is captured by Lie, Lie bracket. That's what satisfies mathematician for more geometric method, this is the Lie derivative. So that failure to commute is basically a form of a derivative. The rate of change of a vector field A with respect to B, which is a Lie derivative. But for us, um, we don't use Lie bracket much as far as I remember, but the adjoint is very important. That ends up being the matrix similarity, change of basis for us. Why? It is important because as we move in the space, we are at a particular point in terms of rotation and translation. However, we want to track everything in the Lie algebra because that's the vector space at the identity we want to work with. In particular, we want to track the covariance and uncertainty at the tangent space in the tangent space add the identity. So the adjoint will help us to map everything from wherever we are to the identity to carry out all the calculation using algebra in a vector space, just like you're working in Rn. And then when it shows up again, that means sometimes it's necessary to go back to make sure we are always doing calculation correctly. Because if you are using matrices in different bases, and you combine them, obviously the calculation won't be correct. So at joint, the adjoint can make, make, make sure these transformations are done correctly and automatically. That's what we will get out of it. But it is that matrix similarity. So I have a code for the cross product that you can check. And we had this question in the chat that is a cross B equals this, and that is true, we have it. I might have this in my longer version of the slides I shared with you. It was just the fact people would look at me, so what? So I removed it. <laughs> now somebody's asking. <laughs> So William, I hope you got your answer, if you're still there. So that's where the Lie bracket comes from. Notice that we're doing everything we can to just do algebra, matrix multiplication. That is nice, we're not working with any complicated geometry per se, and that's, that is a big motivation. Now one question that comes up is the exponential of x and y, if they are a scalar, is of course exponential of x plus y. But if we are working with matrices, this is not true. You cannot just add two matrices, you can try. If it fails for one example, obviously it's not true in general. This is only true if your matrices, two matrices commute. If they don't commute, you cannot just take the exponential and then add them. Now the question is, what is, what is, Equivalent of, because exponential of x is ultimately a group element. You take the exponential of the matrix, x from the Lie algebra, and then you get a matrix. Let's say rotation or trans, uh, rigid body transformation. You do the same thing for y. Ultimately, you have two matrices of this form, R1, R2. 
Now, what is the equivalent of the result in the Lie algebra? What is this z that will give me this outcome in the left side? So the answer to that is the BCH formula, Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff Baker formula. There is no simple answer for that. That's, that's infinite. This infinite series, which only the first two terms are what we thought it would be. If they are commutative, if two vector fields commute, the Lie algebra terms, the Lie bracket will be zero. That's why it was the failure of the terms to commute. You can test, go back to those examples. Why? Because the cross product of a vector by itself or any parallel vector is zero. You just can't do that. That's, that's the reason. So it will disappear if they are commutative. What is interesting about this is that you can have equivalent of matrix multiplication in the group by just manipulating terms in the Lie algebra. That's very magical because we are just doing Lie bracket, Lie bracket operation, nested Lie bracket. This goes infinitely nested. Yet we get to do something that is equivalent of a group operation. This correspondence is not an accident. And in fact, this is a property of Lie groups. Lie groups are generalization of matrix group, but whatever we talked about are true for Lie groups. Not all Lie groups are matrix groups, but the ones that we work with are matrix Lie groups. And that means there is a one-to-one -one correspondences between Lie algebra and the group of these matrices that are nonlinear. We just have to multiply them. This is nice. We can work with a vector space to carry out calculations that will help us to capture whatever problem we want to solve in the Lie group. And that's what exactly we want, we want to do in filtering and state estimation. So that one-to-one -one correspondence is a result of the baker campbell hausdorff formula, although there is no clean formula to do that. But we will use that series for linearization. Some useful Lie groups by now you know, SO3, SE3. This SEK3, you can keep adding, next time I'll talk about it, you can keep adding vector spaces. For IMU, we will add position and velocity. So you get SE23. Not just rigid body transformation, which is rotation and position, we will also add velocity. For SLAM, you can add landmarks. That's all. For legged robots, you can add contacts. This group is very interesting. Seam three, we talked about it, is a generalization of SE3 with the scaling. So next time, we can finally talk about motion of a robot. If I have a robot, it operates in SE2, and I want to calculate the odometry by propagating the covariance, what can I do? You can do it, of course, in 3D as well. So hopefully we can talk about some sensors and how we can 